The world of Amplitude Studios Humankind can be an overwhelming experience even as a veteran of the 4X world. It looks a lot like certain other current historical strategy games out there, of which I have personally received the question repeatedly in my videos and live streams. There are, however, quite a few aspects of humankind that separate it from the others in the 4X genre, and that's exactly what this video is designed to clarify. But before we do, if you are already hooked by what you've seen in Humankind, you can pre-order the game via my Nexus GG game store, where on pre-order you will receive a 100% ethically sound Steam key while also supporting the channel directly. Just throwing that out there, hint, hint, wink, wink. Now, here are my 14 top things that separate humankind in the 4X genre. Let's dive in. The most obvious separation of humankind is the idea of culture stacking with new eras. Instead of choosing one civilization and sticking through them through several millennia, in every new era you step into, you have the option to adopt one of 10 new civilizations on a first come, first serve basis. With six eras in the final game, that means you have the possibility of choosing between 60 different civilizations throughout the entire game, each with their own special perks, buildings, and units. Your final civilization will therefore be made up of six cultures, all stacked on top of each other, which makes for a much more interesting storyline campaign than what we've seen in other 4X strategy games. Fame is the name of the game in Humankind, and it's your only way to win without simply killing everyone on the map. You gain fame through a variety of accomplishments, from completing era stars to fulfilling world deeds, and a variety of other achievements spanning across the ages. Each culture has a preference when it comes to era stars, and focusing on accomplishing those will give you a boost to your era fame progression over the other ones, which can be further boosted if you choose not to progress into a new civilization but transcend with your current one. Last tip. It's not always best to level up to the next era as soon as you have enough stars. You can still gain era stars even if you have enough, which will still increase your fame as well. If you are close to unlocking an era star, just wait a few turns to grab them before progressing into that next era. This one doesn't need too much explanation. There are two main currencies in humankind, money and influence. You'll need influence to take over territories with an outpost, merge cities, claim wonders, and even use it to influence independent city-states. One of the more important factors of influence is that the generation of it pushes your culture out into the world to affect other cities around you. Money can be used to expand your empire by purchasing units, buying out construction, and assigning administrators. You can generate money through district exploitations, assigning populations to work trade districts, as well as through trade and things like vassalizing or war reparations. A deficit of money is possible in this game, and the result is losing stability, or public order, around your entire empire. When it comes to settling downtowns on the world map, humankind operates a bit differently, although if you played Endless Legend, half of this section will be familiar. The world map in humankind is split into territories. Building an outpost with any military unit will claim that territory for yourself, which prevents anyone else from settling on that entire chunk of land unless they destroy your outpost. Outposts are then turned into cities where your usual 4x city building occurs. There is a caveat to this system though. If you have a territory with an outpost that's connected to a city's territory, you can combine these two to create a mega city. The city absorbs all of the stats of that outpost and will be able to take advantage of the districts of said outpost and build on that territory as well. This strategy is a great way to integrate a territory that might give you a surplus of something like food or production to really boost the progress of a city in a positive way. The foundations of humankind are built on creating your own unique empire. Combining cultures is the first part of it. The second lies in your society. Your society is composed of a combination of four sets of ideologies that shape how your culture operates. On each side of these four ideology spectrums, you will get various benefits to areas of your empire. For instance, the top ideology is collectivism versus individualism, with collectivism boosting industry and settlements and individualism boosting money. Each ideology has balanced shifts, and as you get closer to the middle of the spectrum, the benefits coexist, albeit at reduced rates. 
How you shape your society is entirely dependent on how you choose your civics. The civic system is a range of decisions in a very wide range of empire-related areas. Your actions and technological progression will unlock these decisions as you play, however it's only on gaining a civics point that you can actually choose one to make a decision with. Having high stability across all of your cities defines your overall political stability rating, which then determines the pace in unlocking more civil points. Religion isn't quite as in-depth as your society mechanics are, and I believe that's in part because religion is meant to enhance the society rather than stand alone amongst it. The tenets you can unlock are on a first-come, first-served basis, meaning all religions share from the same pool. Faith and religion spread much in the same way as influence does with your culture, and in many unlockable features, influence comes with faith, which kind of makes sense that they'd go hand in hand. It's therefore decently crucial to have a strong religious state to not just influence other cities religiously, but also push your own culture forward as well. The last of your major campaign-wide influences is stability, and it actually serves a multitude of purposes. As previously mentioned, high stability is required to quickly gain civic points, in which turn refines and helps push your civilization society beyond just your walls. However, it also serves a purpose in each of your cities, and that's primarily to prevent steamrolling. Think of stability as public order, and the lower it goes, the higher risk you have of triggering a civil war. How does this prevent steamrolling though? Well, almost every district you construct in your cities causes a reduction in stability. Every territory you add to your main city reduces stability. Even low food production can contribute to it. This means that even if you have the money and or the population to, it might not be the best idea to just buy out everything you can in your cities as you'll suddenly see some pretty huge stability drops. There are several ways to increase your stability in a city, the easiest of which is assigning an administrator to your city. Other ways include certain buildings like a fountain or an aqueduct, planting an army inside the city walls, and lastly through the exploitation of luxury goods. This one's a short one, but crucial to building strategy inside of your cities. To gain population in other strategy games, requires you to have an excess of food, where upon filling a food meter, you gain a population. Things work a bit differently in humankind. Rather than having an excess of food contribute to an overall meter that fills up, there are certain tiers of food production, from starvation to abundance. On reaching above a certain food production and gaining the abundant city stance, your population gets a boost towards population growth rate. This food generation means that once you hit that abundance level, you might as well stop building food buildings as it simply will not do anything to help you grow any faster than it currently is. This is the last of the city-wide effects and it's pretty incredible. It's a mechanic I find amazing for the wonder building side of 4X games. When building a wonder in any city, you have the option to make any of your other cities drop what they are doing and contribute towards building it. Their industry values will combine with whatever city you're building the wonder in, drastically speeding up the production of the wonder. Even though wonders are locked out once a civilization chooses them, it's still nice to crank an entire wonder out in just a handful of turns because all of your cities are helping to rush the construction of it. We're now digging into the diplomacy side of humankind and one of its features is something that should be used in about every strategy game going forward. Under the Military Accords tab of your treaties and diplomacy, you'll find two options, non-aggression pact and tolerate skirmishes. By default, you'll always be set to tolerate skirmishes and here's what that means. Should any army be in either your territory or a neutral territory, you can fight that army without having to declare war on them. You can also raid in neutral territory if that's something you're into. This has a range of diplomatic effects against you should you actually do this, such as creating a crisis, but it would allow you to whittle down a potential enemy without actually declaring war in the first place or let you take care of a pesky army that's raiding your own empire. All right, so let's say that a certain aggressive streamer AI by the name of, I don't, I don't know, Quill18 decides to attack your army in neutral territory or perhaps he established an outpost that butts right up to your city. A range of these types of events will trigger a crisis and there are several ways to handle them. First, you have 10 turns to decide whether to pursue it or not. There's nothing requiring you to do so, but if you want to, you can. Second, you can demand reparations. In the case of a battle, it can be money. For an outpost or an enemy city under your religious control, you can demand they give it to you. Creating this demand will give them the option to respond by either 
refusing, accepting, or countering themselves. A refusal will trigger your war desire, which I'll explain in the next section. Your final option is to renounce a crisis, essentially saying that this isn't something worth fighting over and it will be appreciated by the other side. Crises and demands are a great addition to the genre and I'm glad to see some more diplomatic options added in humankind. War desire is something that can only be really described as a form of casus belli. Rather than come right out and call it that though, in humankind, it's a measure of how willing your population is to be at war with a faction. A high war desire is necessary to justify a legitimate war, although you can certainly choose to launch a surprise war with less war desire, but it will give you some penalties. To increase your war desire, there has to be justification, with crises and pressing your demands, as just mentioned, the key ways to quicken it. Once in a war, the goal is to deplete your enemy's own war desire down to zero. The best way to accomplish this is, quite obviously, defeating enemy armies and taking their cities. Once the enemy's war desire has hit zero, you can make full demands on them, from taking a certain number of their conquered cities to making them a vassal or just demanding money. The military side of humankind is the last major difference I want to talk about and will take up our last two top things. If you played in this legend, most of this will be familiar. To begin, armies are groups of multiple units combined together. In the early stages, these armies are maxed out at 4 units per, but as you progress, more and more slots will unlock, allowing for much larger ones in the future. The big difference when it comes to unit production in humankind is that every unit will cost you one population, as well as a production or industry cost. I believe this system is designed to prevent any early Zerg type rush strategy to build a bunch of units in the early game and steamroll over the competition. With units able to establish outposts to claim territory, there's no need for settlers, and this is another reason for having troops cost population. Battles in warfare go hand in hand, so we'll combine them for this last bit. When the two armies of opposing sides come together to fight a battle, that battle doesn't technically take place on the campaign map. Instead, a special enhanced map pops up. This battle map is a confined space of the campaign map tiles, where the armies then spread out their troops within their own deployment zones before the actual battle commences. There are three important aspects to these battles. The first is terrain, and it does have a heavy influence on the battle. Higher terrain gives bonuses to attack damage or defense, rivers will stop a unit from advancing to the next tile on a turn, and in sieges, fortifications provide massive defensive bonuses. You will always need to take terrain into consideration with every move in order to effectively take out your enemies. The second is battle progression. Each battle consists of a multitude of rounds, where every round consists of a full set of turns for every unit on the board. If the objective is not complete by the end of these five rounds, then the battle is over, you go into the next turn, and then you battle again. The last aspect is one that I've not really seen with battles outside of Total War. When defending in a battle, you will need to defend an actual flag objective. Should the attacker take the flag tile and hold on to it long enough, the battle will be won regardless of how strong the defender still is. This was designed to give the attacker a fighting chance, pun intended, against a much faster moving army. It's a great alternative to typical battles and a smart way to prevent potential losses of your own units as the attacker. And that will be it, 14 top things that separate humankind in the 4X genre. While I understand that some of these top things may exist in other 4X games, as I've mentioned, it's the combination of them that really sets humankind apart, not any one specific thing. Hopefully this video clears up the question of, is humankind like this other strategy guy in an effective manner? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And again, if you've yet to purchase Humankind, you can pre-order now through my Nexus GG store, similar to Humble Bundle or other key stores, and you will help support this channel directly in the process. There are many more planned videos to release on Humankind, believe me, but we will have to wait until we get closer and closer to release. Thank you all very kindly for checking out the video. This is Havoc, and I will see you in the next one.